fuck is you deaf, man? I said we ain't got shit going on right now. So you're supposed to stop because your man got shot. Well, according to Alpo, he said that he told you that he could support. He never told me anything, bro. Have you ever watched the movie Paid in Full? It's about gangsters in New York City, but one of the main characters is based on a real-life gangster named Alpo Martinez. Now the question is, did the movie tell us everything? The answer to that appears to be no, because there's allegedly a lot more we don't know about Alpo Martinez. It's gonna be aight. It's gonna be aight, man. So who was Alpo Martinez? Alpo was a famous drug dealer in the 1980s and 1990s, who started his drugs dealing business in Harlem, New York. Alpo was very smart and knew how to make a lot of money. He worked with other big gangsters like Rich Porter and Ozzy Faison. Together, these three men made millions of dollars from selling drugs. Sounds like a dangerous life, doesn't it? I mean, in the movie, we see a lot of drama and violence. But did you know Alpo did even worse things in real life? He was known for being very violent. He didn't just sell drugs, he also K-ed people. But that's not all. Apparently, even when Alpo was arrested and went to jail, he worked with the police and told on other gangsters to get a shorter prison sentence, who knew the K-er was also a snitch. But did the movie show all this? Not really. With me out the game, <laughs> I drive up on the streets real quick. So why did Alpo become a gangster? Some people think it's because he wanted to escape poverty. Growing up in Harlem wasn't easy. There weren't many good jobs, so selling drugs seemed like a way to make fast money. Do you think this was the right choice? Most people would say no, but for Alpo, it seemed like the only way out. Was he just a product of his environment? It's interesting to think about, isn't it? What will happen to anybody just that away, man? Right, right, right. That's will happen to anybody who disrespect his family. So it would appear that while the movie Paid in Full gave us a glimpse of Alpo's life, it doesn't tell the whole story. Apparently, the real Alpo Martinez was much more complicated. He was a flashy gangster, a care, and a police informant. The movie makes him look like a hero in some ways, but his real life was much darker. Do you think the movie should have shown more of the truth? Let's delve in deeper. Twice in the head, one in the neck, one in the shoulder, one in the hand, and the rest of the shots was in the leg that broke my leg in three different spots. But when you think about Harlem in the 1980s, three names come to mind. Rich Porter, Arizona, and Alpo Martinez. Of these three, Alpo Martinez is arguably the most infamous. His story is filled with hate and drama that has lasted for decades. Alpo's story began in Spanish Harlem, a part of New York City, on June 8, 1966. He grew up in a Puerto Rican family and spoke Spanish fluently. This skill would later help him in the drug business. As a child, Alpo was well-liked by his family and others he met. In the summer, he would stay with a white family through a program called the Fresh Air Fund. He got along well with the family and their children. But when Alpo returned to Harlem after these summer stays, life was different. The neighborhood was changing fast, with more drug dealers appearing. Alpo started his criminal life by robbing these dealers. He also worked as a runner, moving drugs from one place to another. Alpo and his crew became known for being bold and disrespectful. His behavior led to frequent trouble, and his mother eventually sent him away from home to the Fresh Air Fund program again in 1979. By 1983, Alpo was attracting police attention due to petty crimes. He was motivated by a desire to have his own money and not rely on his mother. Alpo loved money and was willing to do almost anything to get it. In 1985, while serving a year in prison for a weapons charge, Alpo became friends with Rich Porter. When he got out, he wanted to find a drug connection. He met AZ Faison, a powerful drug dealer who was skeptical of him at first. Up here, 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 let's eat together. That's that's how it was. If you look out for me, I look out for you. you know okay. I mean? However, Rich Porter spoke highly of Alpo to AZ, which helped him gain trust. Alpo credited AZ for his success, saying AZ gave him chances to prove himself. Alpo's reputation grew as he became more ruthless and focused on making money. AZ used Alpo as an enforcer, handling problems and making sure no one disrespected their organization. Alpo came in the picture when Rich got locked up. And what did he get locked up for? He got locked up, he was in a shootout, he got busted with the gun, he wound up doing a year. That's it? Uh, yeah. As Alpo's role grew, he took on tasks like managing large amounts of 
and dealing with stick-up kids who robbed AZ's spots. When these robbers caused trouble, Alpo dealt with them effectively. AZ then moved his operation to a new location on 135th Street and offered Alpo a spot on 145th Street. Alpo took it while others turned it down. In the mid-1980s, Alpo was out of prison and eager to dominate the streets. He and his partners were making between $40,000 to $50,000 a week each. Alpo loved the attention and used his charm to get noticed, whether it was for good or bad reasons. He was known for riding dirt bikes and kicking police cars, which led to high-speed chases. He and his crew often went to Myrtle Beach to show off their bikes and cars. The price is so good, the quality is so good, so now the whole hood coming to you. Okay. Because you got a cheaper price and you got good product. You understand? So it's moving. However, this same love Alpo had for the limelight eventually led to problems. As already highlighted, he liked to show off by doing things like riding motorcycles through the city, crashing them, and then buying new ones the next day. He spent thousands of dollars just on fireworks because he liked being the center of attention. This behavior made him stand out, which is not good in the drug business where staying unnoticed is key. Rich Porter, on the other hand, preferred to stay out of the spotlight. He wanted to keep a low profile to avoid trouble, but Alpo couldn't understand this need for discretion, and his flashy lifestyle eventually caused problems. The first of these young drug dealers to face serious trouble was Azi Faison. He was attacked and shot nine times, including two shots to the head, but he survived. I got shot in the head twice, man, and five people were in, in that situation. With, you know, three people died, and uh, three people lived. After this brutal assault, Ozzy decided to leave the drug trade. Alpo, however, saw an opportunity in Washington, D.C. When a big drug dealer named Rafael Edmonds was arrested, Alpo moved in to take over the market. Alpo's business in D.C. was very profitable. He made a lot of money and often brought duffel bags full of cash back to New York. Despite the risks, Alpo and Rich Porter continued to work together sharing business and suppliers. Alpo's ability to move quickly and adapt to new opportunities helped him become a major player in the drug trade. He could buy large amounts of cocaine in New York for $18,000 a kilo and sell them in Washington, D.C. for a $3,000 profit per kilo. All it took was a five-hour drive to D.C. and a little time to find his customers. He had many connections and could get lots of cash, just like his rival, Rafael Rich Porter. After a while, Martinez decided to change his way of doing business. Instead of selling small amounts of drugs on the streets, he started selling large quantities, or kilos, to many of Rich's old customers. Sometimes he bought his product from Rich Porter, who was also a big player in the drug trade. However, this new business strategy put a strain on their friendship. Rich allegedly started overcharging Martinez by $3,000 to $5,000 per kilo, which added up to a lot of money when buying 100 or 200 kilos at a time. This was where their issue became more prominent, eventually leading to Alpo confronting Rich. Martinez believed that Porter was also lying about the connect he used to purchase the product. All the money they made together suddenly didn't matter. Porter's slaying was always going to be major news that would shake up the balance of power, but his K-ing at the hands of a man whom many saw as his brother was a real big deal. To me, I felt right then it was somebody within the circle. I was meeting Rich that night, he got into a van. Once he got in the van, I locked the doors. As I was pulling off, I was asking him, yo, Rich, where did you get that coke from? That's, that was good, because I wanted to make him comfortable. Martinez once recounted, I was very mad. I just kept a net A that I loved. A nene, uh, I called my brother. Martinez's actions showed how ruthless the drug game had become. Once there were three kings of Harlem's drug scene. One gave up the game after surviving two bullets to the head. The second king, Rich Porter, was by the third king, Alpo Martinez. Rich gets Yes, sir, Poe, Rich. Poe, I believe, walk away with the birds. You feel me? <laughs> after Rich's M, Alpo fled to D.C. because his name was becoming too well-known in New York. He moved to D.C. permanently, where the city was notorious for its high M rate and drug problems. In the early 1990s, Washington, D.C. was known as the M capital of the U.S., with a significant number of homicides related to drug deals. I said, all right. So I said, right, give me a minute, Poe. I went upstairs. You understand? And I came back down. I didn't know what was going on. Washington, D.C. had a high number of 
s especially in black neighborhoods. The city's struggle with drugs and crime made it a dangerous place. The crime rate was so high that it affected many lives, with shootings happening almost every night. In DC, Alpo continued his illegal activities, but the city's violence and crime made it a dangerous environment. The murder rate in the city was alarming, with many victims being caught in the crossfire of drug wars. At that time, a guy called Wanye was controlling DC in terms of drugs, robberies, and violence. This was a guy that by the time he was 12 years old in 1974, had allegedly already committed his first this dark start marked the beginning of his life in crime. As a kid, Wayne also sold drugs. Four years later, in 1978, Wayne took his criminal activities up a notch by robbing banks. Tragically, his little brother was K-Ed by a police officer during one of these bank robberies. But despite the danger, Wayne managed to escape each time he committed a robbery, earning him a nickname that reflected his daring nature. In 1984, Wayne found himself in a dangerous situation. Rivals started shooting at him, and he fired back. Arrests were made, and Wayne was charged. But despite his reputation, though, the police testified that Wayne was defending himself. The jury agreed and found Wayne not guilty. He was sent to Lorton Youth Center but was released in 1987. When he got out, Wayne had no money but a strong determination. He put together a new crew and became a hitman. Wayne kept his criminal activities hidden from most people. He was known for his complex personality often coming off as a clown to keep others off guard. But despite that persona, he became a feared figure on the streets, robbing drug dealers of their money, jewelry, and drugs. He shared the loot with his crew and demanded loyalty from them. This was the time Alpo was making his way into DC. He learned about the area and started making connections, bringing in millions. But as Alpo grew stronger, he faced threats and attempted extortion. But then, Michael Frey Salters, known as the godfather of DC, aimed to take over. Frey had a strong reputation and was expected to become the top player in DC's drug scene. Alpo, however, wasn't interested in Frey's plans. He wanted to be number one himself. Wayne, meanwhile, was back in prison on an attempted charge with a $10,000 bail. The streets were relieved that he was locked up, but this wouldn't last long. A little while later, Shelton Shorty Pop Watkins, a leader of the Junkyard Band, made a call that changed everything. Shorty Pop had connections with Wayne and wanted to get him out of jail. He knew Alpo, who was looking for protection, and offered to pay Wayne's bail. Alpo saw this as an opportunity to gain more power and agreed to help. Wayne's release from jail was just the beginning of more changes to come. Alpo knew that helping Wayne would benefit him in the long run. By getting Wayne out, Alpo hoped to gain his loyalty and support. Once Wayne was out, Alpo and Wayne became close friends. They worked together, but their relationship wasn't without problems. Many people were unhappy with Alpo because Wayne was feared by many. Wayne was known for being tough and dangerous, and some hoped he would stay in jail. Wayne was loyal and respected Alpo for getting him out of jail. Although Wayne didn't handle drugs or money, he played an important role. He was responsible for security, making sure no one disrespected Alpo or tried to harm him. Alpo trusted Wayne with his safety, but kept his money and drug stashes a secret from him. Alpo believed it was better for Wayne to know less about his operations. This way, Wayne would have no reason to betray Alpo since he was well taken care of. Alpo and Wayne Perry uh, had a woman uh, two blocks away from the White House. The Constitution Hall, they be throwing shows on the Constitution, I heard about that. Despite their dangerous business, Alpo and Wayne worked well together. Alpo made sure Wayne was rewarded for his loyalty, and Wayne continued to protect Alpo from anyone who might want to harm him. They both benefited from their partnership. Alpo was making millions, and Wayne was able to support his family while working for Alpo. However, things started to change. Alpo's enemies were plotting against him. One such enemy was Frey, who wanted Alpo dead. So Wayne and Alpo hatched a plan to take Frey out. On July 16, 1991, Wayne shot Frey, who died the next morning. But that only brought more police scrutiny. After Frey's death, the authorities began to investigate Alpo more closely. Rich Porter's cousin, Nathaniel Peanut Watkins, told the police that Alpo was the big boss behind the drug deals. Peanut said he had seen Alpo give $300,000 to a dealer, sending money to New York. As the police were still gathering more intel on Alpo activities, he was still busy committing more atrocities. In the 1980s, a man named Dimencio Montana Benson, often known simply as Montana, made a name for himself in Brooklyn. He was a powerful drug dealer with a reputation that soon spread to Washington, D.C. Montana built strong connections with local dealers in 
D.C., making it his second home. He earned the nickname Montana from the locals as he worked hard on Montana Avenue and treated the people there with respect. However, Montana's life took a dark turn when he crossed paths with Alpo Martinez. Montana began an affair with Alpo's wife. Alpo didn't find out about this betrayal until his wife told him that Montana had slapped her in the face. Furious and seeking revenge, Alpo made a plan with his associate, Wayne Perry, to K Montana. One day, Alpo's revenge plan came to fruition. After a basketball game, Montana was ambushed. He was shot in the face by Alpo's men in broad daylight. This m didn't go unnoticed by the police. It only added to the list of crimes that authorities were already investigating him for. Alpo's criminal activities were extensive, and the police had been tracking him for a while. They were already building a case against him when Montana was K-Ed. This only strengthened their belief that Alpo was a major player in the criminal underworld. Exactly how many bodies Martinez piled up over the course of his life may never be known, but nearly two years after the hit on Porter, Martinez's world came to a screeching halt. History remembers Novi. 7. 1991 As the day Magic Johnson announced his retirement from the NBA, after being diagnosed as HIV positive. But on that same day, Martinez, 25, was arrested in Southeast Washington, bookending a year-long manhunt by the FBI for one of the more powerful drug dealers in America. A day later, Martinez sat in a courtroom hearing the list of charges with his name on them. Authorities also wanted information on the slayings of big-time Washington drug dealer Michael Anthony Salters, aka Frey, and Timothy Cohen and Mark Mullen. The latter two were in broad daylight at an Oxon Hill, Maryland car wash. Martinez didn't say much in the courtroom that day. He sniffled loudly, and his eyes filled with tears, the Washington Post reported at the time. He was staring at 14 counts of including the deaths of Porter and his 12-year-old brother William, Saos, and the real possibility of death row. Under immense pressure, Alpo decided to cooperate with the authorities. He agreed to provide information about Wayne Perry, who was also facing charges. This deal was his chance to avoid the death penalty. Alpo's lawyer told him that the best way out was to help the police catch Wayne Perry. Alpo's cooperation led to Wayne Perry being sentenced to five life terms without the possibility of parole. Few people who get into the drug game are granted a safe exit strategy. Death or prison are often the only outcomes. Martinez was desperate for any sort of a win, so he decided to cooperate with authorities. And because of that breach of street code, many of the same people he made money with in the streets became wards of the state. And to me, I did not snitch on Rich. I did not snitch on Alpo or anybody, Lulu. One figure in particular was Wayne Perry, a man described by Lorton Legends author Aoni Williams as the most infamous hitman to ever walk the streets of the nation's capital. Perry was eventually sentenced to five consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. In exchange for his testimony, Martinez was sentenced to 35 years and eventually was released into the Witness Protection Program in 2015. Now, many folks have been wondering if Mary J. Blige helped Alpo Martinez get a movie deal before he died. After his release, Alpo tried to make a name in movies. Mary J. Blige, a popular singer and actress, was rumored to be involved in this project. Before his death, it was said that Blige might have played a role in helping him with the movie deal. The Yonkers Times reported that the notorious drug kingpin turned informant was very busy during his last year of living. The local news outlet says that the Harlem, New York native grew tired of other entities detailing his rise to infamy without his consent or direction. Once he became a free man, he sought to tell his story on a large platform and then synced with none other than legendary stylist Misa Hilton Brim. The influencer who shares a child with Sean Diddy Combs allegedly paired up Martinez with her longtime good friend Mary J. Blige and the family affair songstress plugged him with some of her contacts in Hollywood. The negotiations were to have been with Lionsgate Productions. The entertainment conglomerate was set to open a movie studio in Yonkers in 2022 and the project was set to be shot there starting in 2023. When you consider that Lionsgate also owns the Stars Network, home to power book two, and the new location is also Mary's hometown. The yarn doesn't seem so far-fetched. Additionally, the streets say that Alpo and Misa were dating prior to his death. In Paid in Full, Cameron's portrayal of Rico was meant to be unforgettable, making people talk about him, even after the film. But beyond Paid in Full, Alpo has also been popular in songs. Rappers like Jay-Z and Meek Mill have mentioned Martinez in their songs. In his music, Meek Mill compared a jealous character to Martinez. 
Even Nas and other rappers have referenced him. Even Martinez's son, Paparazzi Poe, who he met as an adult, is also trying to make it in rap. His new single, Brick Squad Monopoly, came out shortly before Martinez died. On October 31st, 2021, Alpo was shot dead in his Ram truck on Frederick Douglass Boulevard in Harlem. As he was dying, he threw out the drugs he had in his car. His life, which had been marked by violence and crime, ended right where it began, in the streets of Harlem. Wayne Perry, on the other hand, took a different path. He converted to Islam while in prison and began sending messages to young people outside, urging them to avoid the life of crime he had lived. He hoped to guide others away from the dangerous streets and encourage them to make better choices. Truly, the story of Alpo Martinez is a grim reminder of how quickly life can spiral out of control when you choose a path of crime and betrayal.